I love telling stories about the Bible. I'll tell you why. Because I'm a third generation Christian kid. And if I'm not looking for a show of hands, but you've got to understand, if you're a third generation Christian kid, sometimes, just sometimes, the Bible can be boring. <laughs> you just got to understand until you realize that it's a moving narrative. It's not a static report, but a moving narrative. And so today, I hope you don't mind, I'm just going to tell some Bible stories. You know why? Because we're having a human experience in a sacred narrative. And it's the humanness of the Bible that makes it real. We read the Bible in hindsight and we're like, yeah, how stupid. They should have known better. But we read it and we're like, Oh my goodness, if I was in that situation, how different would we have really been? Like there's a truly funny thing. And uh, in the book of John, for instance, this is not my sermon, this is a quick intro, but I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something cool that I found because I haven't preached it yet. So in the book of John, John takes time. The resurrection of Jesus has happened. I mean, he beat death. Eternal salvation outside of time kind of stuff has the ability to walk through walls. And John goes, but I beat Peter to the tomb. (laughs) Like out of all the information that he could have put in there, he made sure he said, and the Jesus, and and, and the disciple whom Jesus loved, speaking about himself, beat Peter to the tomb. A little bit of healthy competition there, right? There's so much healthy competition that in, you know, Jesus walks on water, Right? The only miracle. Jesus walks on water and Peter, the only human being to have ever walked on water in the history of the world. And I tried every summer. I'm not going to lie. I tried every summer. I get to my parents' pool because I live in Queensland. So like we don't swim unless it's 38 degrees or above. We get there and you pray a prayer. And like you try to get ugly with it because Pentecostals, we pray ugly. And the, the more uglier we get, the more spiritual it is. And... And, and then we put our foot. And I've never, ever been able to walk on water. So this is an amazing miracle, right? Yeah. The book of John says, Jesus walked on water, scared the disciples. He gets in the boat and they're on the other side. Where's Peter walking on water? <laughs> right? Isn't it funny and interesting that in the middle of a human experience, there's this sacred narrative and God goes, I'll use you anyway. Yeah. I'll use you anyway. And so part of my life and what I do is I have this convergence of ministry and marketplace. It's a lot of fun. And I have the ability and the privilege to talk about the royal priesthood all the time, the idea that kings had authority on earth, but priests had access to heaven. And we are the convergence zone of both. 1 Peter 2, 9, we're a royal priesthood. And so I really hope you come tomorrow night because I'm going to actually talk about how to outwork being a spirit-led leader with a strategic mapping. Because spirit-led means this. If I'm spirit-led first, because what does it say in Romans? That those that are spirit-led are the sons and daughters of God. Which means when I'm spirit-led first, before I'm strategic, I'm stepping into my identity before I'm talking into my purpose. Because who knows this? A gift is a great tool, but a horrible slave master. Because if you become gift-addicted, you end up being addicted to something that's inferior to your design. And so today, I want to talk about two game-changing moments of leaders in the Bible, Moses and David, who were presence-led before they were purpose-driven. And I love purpose-driven. You've got to understand, I lead leaders into clarity, enabling them to bring heaven to earth every day of my life. That's my life. That's what I do. That's my purpose. And I love being purpose-driven, and I love the book. If anyone's watching, I like the book. I love the book. I love the teaching. However, there's a prequel to being purpose-driven. It's being presence-led. And so can we go on that journey this morning? So let's jump to Exodus 33 on the slide. If we go to the first slide, Exodus 33. This is what it says. God has asked Moses to go and fulfill his purpose. And then he says this, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, please do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me? 
The game changer isn't your purpose. The game changer isn't your plans. The game changer isn't your strategic mapping even. The game changer is his presence. The game changer is presence. And you go, Andrew, how, how, what do you mean his presence? I mean, when you become aware of his presence means I'm not praying a fancy prayer. I'm emptying my thoughts and my plans to say, God, I just want your presence. Yeah. I'm just, I'm aware. And to the point of where you can be aware of his presence with every breath that you take. Yeah. How will we be different from everybody else? It's not in your planning or programming. It's in his presence. How do you reach a community? It's in his presence. Are all those other things important? Yes and amen, but not if they are overshadowing his presence. Can we rewind? Because I see everything in movies, right? I'm one of those creative people that if you give me dot points, I'll get lost. But if you show me a storyboard, I'll learn. Like I'm just waiting for Quentin Tarantino to do a real version of the Bible movie. John Wick kind of David and Goliath stories. So let's jump back. Let's rewind a little bit to Exodus 3. I'm going to stand up here if that's okay. It says this, Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take the sandals off your feet. And we know this part of the story because Moses has failed and he has made a mistake. He got driven to the wilderness and he works for his father-in-law if that wasn't punishment enough. So he works for his father-in-law and as he's tending the sheep and the flock and everything else, he is walking and a burning bush speaks to him. A burning bush talks to a human being. And we just read it like it's normal. (laughs) At some point, don't you think Moses would have thought, I wonder if my father-in-law put some weird herbs in my kebab. And so here he goes, the burning bush is speaking to him and he calls him by name. He calls him by name. God calls him by name. You ever felt called by God and then confused by God? He called him and then said, stop. But but God, you called me. He said, yeah, I called you, but you got to be obedient before you step into my presence. So we're called, but are we obedient? We're called, so he calls him by name. And he comes closer and he says, do not draw any closer. Take the sandals off your feet. See, shepherds, very simple people. They had two protective mechanisms, sandals and a rod or a staff, a shepherd's staff. And what does he say? He says, before you step into my presence, I need you to take the protective mechanisms off. I need you to take the protective mechanism, mechanism off. Why? Because... Sand was hot. Why do they wear sandals? The sand was hot. The rocks were sharp. There were scorpions and snakes. And yet God says, no, take all those protective mechanisms off. Because when you step into my presence, you can't be wearing a plan B. You can't wear a plan B. It's the otherwise, the lest we, if we're going King James. Oh, I've got a plan Well, God's called me awesome, but I've got a plan just in case he doesn't turn up. God's like, "Mm mm-mm. Take the sandals off your feet. And then he says, where you stand is holy ground. Not the closer you get to the bush is holy ground. No, when I call you by name and you take the protective mechanisms off, everywhere you stand is holy ground. So we, 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 we sometimes look at places and industries, and, and, and I do this because I, I work in corporate. We look at industries and we go, God could never be there. Do we realise, can I, can I speak to you this morning? Do we realise sometimes that if there is an industry or a region or a city or a place where you think there is a principality and power, if I can use that terminology, do we realise, and we go, oh, the enemy's got that. Let's just be really clear. Anything... That is rightfully God's. And the enemy is on a mountain of influence, whatever you might call it. It means the enemy is illegally squatting on what is rightfully our inheritance. And see, if we do that, see, there's no rent, there's no squatter's rights in the kingdom. And the creation is waiting for us to turn up to those places to rightfully give them back to the sons and daughters of God. 
it, it, we'd go, God, you wouldn't go there. And then David would write, but even if I made my bed in hell, you would be with me. The very place we think God would never go, he's right there. So everywhere you go is holy ground. When you walk in and your boss is cranky, everywhere you go is holy ground because the kingdom has a higher exchange rate. Everywhere you go is holy ground. If there's a power and a principality there, well, then you turn up with the right to evict it. All right, so. And then he says, moreover, I'm the God of your father. And he names, when God gives us, he calls us into his presence. What does he remind us of? Our family lineage. I have this for you because I see your legacy. Okay, let's keep reading. Then he jumps to Exodus 4. If we go to the next slide over. So he's been asked, will you go and deliver my people? Then Moses says, and answers and says, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. Let's keep reading. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. I'm pretty sure at this point he would have thought, I should have kept my sandals on. (laughs) So he takes his other protective mechanism, watch this, and he throws it on the ground. But the ground has now become what? Holy. And we have Facebook, Instagram, hashtags. But shepherds, had their staff and rod. And in their staff and rod, they would etch lines in it that would mark their history and their story. So you ever been to a house and in the, usually it's the pantry door, somewhere near the kitchen, and they, and they put lines in it about how big their kids were, age, height, all that stuff. Well, this was that. This, this was that to them. You know, they would, they would etch and, and Moses in his storyline had failure upon failure upon failure upon disqualification of why I could never be used by God. And what does God ask him to do? He goes, take that old story and throw it on holy ground. And when he throws it on holy ground, now I'm gonna use a term I don't use very often, but I have to for the sake of the story. In essence, it manifests. Because an old story in the presence of God reveals itself that it can't be taken into your future. So he throws it on the ground and it manifests. And a manifestation, we, we, we always go, especially if you've been in Christianity for long enough, you go, oh, that's the really bad stuff. You know, it's like sin and da-da-da-da. You know, sometimes the old story is just an old mindset. Sometimes it's just an old way of doing things or, or a negative way of doing things. Or, 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 a, or a limited mindset that says God couldn't. And that's been the story of your life. And God says, throw it on holy ground. And isn't God so nice to do this? He doesn't go and get all the other shepherds in the area and say, hey guys, check this out. His story is manifesting. Let's YouTube it. Let's hashtag Moses' manifestation. We don't always need, when we're being dealt with by God, we don't need an audience because God is kind and he likes to keep you to keep your dignity. And so there he is throwing his old story on the ground and then he says, pick it up. By what? The tail. Now, if you understand symbolism, you understand the head means authority and the tail means you have authority. And so Moses picks up his old story by the tail and it becomes a new story. Can we just take a pause just a moment right now? There's old stories that maybe you've carried for too long. And then the presence of God, he just wants you to pick up a new story. But no protective mechanisms now. Sandals are off, rods on the ground. The old story is now in the presence of God on holy ground. And it may look like, whoa, I didn't see it for what it really was. And then he says, pick it up. Because no longer, and after today, 19th of June, 2022, there'll be old stories that get thrown on the ground today and picked up with authority that will, ne- and they will never have authority over you ever again. Because you're walking out with a new story. 
walking out with a new narrative. This is the God story for you. And you can live free. Let's go to the next slide. Genesis 3. So the Lord God said to the servant, because you have done this, you were cursed more than all cattle. And in 17, cursed is the ground for your sake. Do we realize that when God is encountering or Moses is encountering God, the two things that were cursed in the garden have now been reversed? Because humanity wasn't cursed in Eden. Adam and Eve weren't. They were affected by it, but they weren't directly cursed. Only the serpent and only the ground. What were the two things that were redeemed in this story? The ground and the serpent. The curse and the authority that it had with the serpent was no more. And so Sally Lloyd-Jones, the, the writer of the Jesus book Story Bible, it's one of the best storybook Bibles you'll ever read for kids. She says this, every story whispers his name. Even in Moses' encounter with God, there's a reversing of the curse. And in Moses', for your new story, for Moses' new story, for my grandkids' new story, and I'm not old enough to have grandkids yet, but this is what I'm saying, is I can speak into their generation because here's what I know. When their old story and their new story gets picked up, here's what I know. The curse is reversed. The redemption is always picked up through all of Scripture. Yeah. And so Moses could walk out delivered because the curse was reversed. Let's go to the next slide. So you have to remove your protective mechanisms to experience the fullness of God's presence and your purpose. His story, Moses had to be delivered so that he could be a deliverer. Yeah. In order to deliver people, you have to, in order to, to see the fullness of the kingdom of heaven in your world, Sometimes you've got to take our protective me mechanisms off and throw our old stories on the ground in order to pick up the new story. And when you are willing to throw your old story onto holy ground, you will be given authority to write a new story. Before I jump to David, who wants a new story this morning? Okay, let's go to the next slide over and we start with David. But in order to understand David, you've got to understand King Saul. That's the context he was in. So here we're talking about Saul's dad, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. I love the Bible. I hate this verse. <laughs> Why is good looking and tall in the same kind of description? My wife always said she wants to marry someone tall, dark, and handsome. Then she goes, well, two out of three ain't bad. But if there was a bachelor Israel, King Saul, imagine being remembered for all of history. He was just really, 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 really good looking. That's his story. Let's go to the next slide. And so here we have King Saul. They want a, they want a king. Israel wants a king. They want to be, this is almost their cry. We want to be like everybody else. What was Moses' cry? Lord, that your presence would go with us so we would be different from everybody else. And so the people go, we want to be like everybody else. So give us a king. So he gives them a king. And it says this, Samuel took a flask of oil. If you're bookmarking in your head, I want you to remember that. A flask of oil. They took a flask of oil, a man-made flask of oil. And then it says that he was anointed and poured on his head. After his anointing, he's heading home, remembering this, that Saul lost his father's donkeys. Donkeys were like the Mercedes-Benz of the day. His father was wealthy. He had influence. And yet his son could even take care of the business. So he lost his donkeys. And as he's lost his donkeys, he's now coming. He's found the donkeys. He's on his way home after being anointed. Then check this out. He finds a group of prophets and then he prophesies among them. He prophesies among them like he's some really spiritual person. 
But he could only prophesy when he was surrounded by a group of prophets. His spirituality and intimacy with God was reactive, not creative. Now, for words, people, do you know that creative and reactive have exactly the same letters in it? They have exactly the same letters in it. The only difference is which order you put them in. So you and I can be given the same tools, the same presence, the same church service. And what we do with it is either creative or reactive. It's like being given the same recipe with the same ingredients, but having a very different outcome. And so Saul is completely reactive because he'd be the guy that could only pray if he was around prayers. He could only worship if he was around worshippers. And how great is the worship team? But they don't follow you to work. They don't follow you to your cranky boss's meeting or that tough family environment. They don't follow you there. So what is the depth of your spirituality? Can you create something because you've taken your protective mechanisms off, because you're in the presence of God and you've got a new story, do you have the authority to shift the atmosphere when need be? Or do we wait for someone else to prophesy so we can prophesy? Let's go to the next slide. When we look at David, we see this. It says this about David. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at his heart. In essence, we've made this mistake before. Let's not do it again. Let's go to the next slide. Now he was ruddy. Watch how they describe David. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking, pleasant to look at. Means he wasn't ugly. He was cute. I, I youth pastored and young adult pastored for long enough. And, you know, as you see all the, ki- you know, the, the young people grow up and they have kids and everything else. And you've got to be a good Christian when you see their babies. <laughs> you look at these babies and they show you with such pride and you go, wow, so cute. <laughs> and Alice and my wife would be like, You've got to stop saying they're cute. And I'm like, why? She goes, don't you know the definition of cute? I went, no, enlighten me. She goes, it means it's interesting but ugly. (laughs) I'm like, what do you mean? I've been called cute my whole life. (laughs) So David was cute. He was cute. He didn't have the stature of Saul. He didn't have the height of Saul. He was pleasant to look at. Then Samuel took the horn of oil. What did I tell you to bookmark before? Flask of oil. What was David anointed with? A horn of oil. History would say that it takes four liters of oil to do an anointing. The difference between Saul's anointing and David's anointing was something had to die for David's. A sacrifice had to be made for David's anointing. And we now are recipients of the ultimate sacrifice for our anointing. And it's messy. Four liters of oil is messy. I know churches actually that still do a four liter anointing service. They stand in a little pool, a little blow up pool, and they just pour it. Don't wear your good clothes that day. (laughs) Four liters of oil. Something had to die for David's anointing. And he would live in the fullness of that. See, the man-made flask is us keeping our protective mechanisms on, saying, I can do it myself, and it's drip. It's a dripped, in, a dripped anointing. So we're just anointed enough to be reactive. We're just anointed enough to get the job done. But we're not anointed enough to be intimate and be in His presence. And so I've got to get messy. Can I be honest with you? The anointing's messy. The anointing's messy. I'm telling you right now, and this is what I love about God, is I love to be in the place where He breaks the, we, you know, that He breaks the rules that He never made up. I like the idea that God breaks rules that He never made up. I want to be in agreement with that. And so there's this horn of oil and David's dripping. And if we really understand the story, do you realize that David was anointed king? 
And then he had to go back to his father's field dripping with oil. Can you imagine going back to the sheep pen, dripping with oil, wondering and looking at your brothers going, Did, were, were you not there when I was anointed king? Isn't this below my pay grade? And he's dripping with oil, cleaning up the sheep. And here's what's so beautiful about the story of David, is that he never lost his father's sheep. And sheep were the not Mercedes Benz of the day. He fought a bear and a lion to protect his, his father's business. What would Jesus say when he's 12? I'm just about my father's business. David would kill a bear and a lion to protect his father's sheep whilst being anointed king. And Saul's like, I know where the donkeys are. David knew how to be a caretaker, a good steward of his father's business, even if it cost him his life, which made him the better king. If we get the next slide over, we have to ask ourselves, what's the source of our anointing, a man-made flask or a sacrificial horn? When you walk into your workplace, are you just, are you dripped on or are you dripping? When you touch the photocopy, it should be dripping with oil. Dripping with oil is saying, whoever touches is going to be blessed. You feel the presence of God everywhere you go. Why? Because we live in a higher exchange rate. I'm pretty young for what I do in life. I just know that. Most people are taller than me and older than me. When I walk into corporate boardrooms, I've managed seven succession plans for churches. Most people have been reading the Bible for longer than I've been alive. And this is what I asked some of my mentors and close friends, just like Pastor Danny. I said, what do I do when I'm intimidated? You know what some of my closest fathers of the faith said to me? They said, you have the Holy Spirit. You should never be intimidated. Because he has the answers, not you. And see, we, when we understand that, the one that holds all the answers to the questions you're afraid to answer lives in you, you're never intimidated. Because the exchange rate that we live in is higher than the face of the intimidation we're in. All right, all right, let's keep reading. I want to show you this and bring it to a close. See, Saul had the stature of a leader, but the spirit of a follower. But David had the stature of a follower, but the spirit of a leader. It's not just about what looks good on the outside. We don't live from the outside in. We live from the inside out. And this might be a word for somebody but if there is a circumstance, you have a covenant that is stronger than that circumstance. Our covenant is the inside out. The circumstance is the outside in. And if we have a revelation of the new covenant that we live in, that circumstance has to bow its knee. Yeah. Under the new covenant, I'm going to say this, but I'll say it for another teaching moment. It, under the new covenant, it is illegal for you not to be blessed. Not happy. Blessed. Because there are things that have made me unhappy. And in a year's time, I went, oh my Lord, that was a blessing. The kingdoms were built on how hungry their king was for the presence of God. Let's go to the next slide over. Then he took, this is David, he's facing Goliath. Saul should have had to kill Goliath. That was Saul's responsibility. But David goes in. And what does he take down to the brook to get the five smooth stones? He takes his rod, his staff. Now, what was that staff? It was his story. It was his story. Do you know that David was anointed to be king, not fight Goliath? He was anointed to be king. He never actually had to fight Goliath. It might have been even easier if Goliath just killed Saul. Here's what David knew, that being anointed king was his calling. That was where he was going. But Goliath was just going to get in the way. And sometimes when Goliaths get in the way, we've got to remember our new story. He killed a lion and he killed a bear and now he was going to take Goliath. Because your story is what gives you the faith to take on the giants. 
I always say this about faith is, faith is saying yes before God finishes the question. Because it's not about the question. It's about who's asking it. And if I know who's asking, I don't need him to finish the question, I'll say yes. So he runs in and he heads and he runs toward the Philistine, Goliath, because his story was so compelling. I say this, clarity gives you a guilt-free no and a compelling yes. Who wants a, who wants a guilt-free no? Come tomorrow night and I'll show you how to get it. But I want a compelling yes. And that yes is in my new story. Not a dripped on anointing, a dripping anointing. Let's go to the next slide. David would write in Psalm 23, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I have never, ever, ever on a bad day decided to go behind my house, because I live near the bush in Queensland, to go behind my house and break off a big shepherd's crook, staff, rod thing, a tree branch and take it to bed with me and give it a good old cuddle because I've had such a bad day, God. I usually eat like, you know, like a bucket of M&Ms or something. Give me my ice cream bucket. But David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the dark places... It's your rod and they staff, they comfort me. What does he mean? He's saying, God, your story in the darkest places of my life, the story comforts me because I know I can get up tomorrow because of your story. And not the old story filled with failures. No, the new story that I picked up with authority. Let's go to the next slide. Do not, David fails. He messes up really badly. He's got money. He has power. He has a throne. He has a nation. And look at what he says. He says, do not cast me away from your presence. You can take everything else away from me, but don't take me away from your presence because you know what? In your presence, I can get that stuff back. But if I keep that stuff without your presence, I have to maintain it. But God, take the throne, take everything. I don't care. But God, whatever you do, don't take your presence. And in these seasons of, I don't even call it strategic planning anymore. I call it mapping because God knows we don't know what to do with plans anymore. In all of the disruptions, I say, God, whatever, just not your presence. That's all I need is his presence. I'm going to close with this final thought. If I have the musicians up, please. Let's go to the next line. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. David writes this from a place of, God, if I can't have your presence, I'll just be a doorkeeper. And all the host teams were like, yes and amen. Just, I'll be a doorkeeper. I'll just be a doorkeeper. I'm happy to be a doorkeeper. As long as I'm close enough, I can smell the food, but I can't eat it, but that's good enough. Then dwell in the tents of wickedness. The, t- the, the tents of wickedness was where power could sit. The tent of power and planning and strategic conquests. He said, no, 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 I, I just, I'd be a doorkeeper because I don't want to be in that company. I'd let that go. Not even just to be in your presence, just to be close to it. We'll go to the next slide, because there's words in the Bible that just really, really intrigued me. Like, what is that about the doorkeeper? So this is what it reads like. The doorkeeper was a very important and privileged job, only entrusted to the most capable, loyal, and trained priest. His job was to make sure that no one who was unclean or undeserving would be allowed to enter the temple of the Lord. In this way, God's house would not be defiled. The incredible honor for this priest was that he had the incredible position to be in God's approximate presence, approximate, close to, not intimacy, but just so close that, to it that only a small fraction of humanity could ever experience. The idea of this doorkeeper was that he would let people in into an area of the temple and he would check whether they were clean or unclean. 
And they, so he had to check, like, did they have rashes or anything on their physicality that would not allow them to come in. But they also post that. You ever been embarrassed to go like, oh, you know, there's a funny rash that I've got, you know, people are checking it at the door. And then the other thing is only Jewish men could come into this part. Jewish men. There was one thing that Jewish men had and they had to get checked. Next. It's not like you could have photo ID. You had to check whether they were circumcised, whether they could come in. And David is saying, I will give up power, authority, and influence just to check IDs. Just to check. Here's what we have to realize is our titles, our power, our influence that we've probably given ourselves mean nothing without the presence of God. I mean, nothing without the presence of God. And David, in a movie, we'd call this a juxtaposition. He uses the most extreme kind of language to say, I don't need any of that. And I would do that job just to be close. Just to be close. Would you stand up to your feet and let me pray for you this morning? I appreciate you all so, so much to allow me to speak into your life. I hope that today you will be able to remove the protective mechanisms that maybe you hold and that you step into the presence of God free to pick up a new story with a fresh authority and do not let that old story define you. But love the presence so much that there's no title, nor power, nor influence that can ever make you value that more than the presence of God. Would you close your eyes and just raise your hands real quick. Father, right now, we just come before you because you are a good, good Father and we are so grateful to you. We thank you that you call us by name and then protect us when we're vulnerable and that we can take our old story with dignity and throw it on holy ground and then pick up a new story in you that allows us to face our Goliaths, that allows us to face whatever challenges we have because we're dripping with oil. And so everywhere we go, we bring the presence of God because everywhere we go becomes holy ground. And may your presence be everything that we want because God, we wanna be presence led before we are purpose driven. And so for every family represented here, for every leader represented here, we pray your blessing of a presence filled and led life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.